Well, tonight I was hoping we could, uh, we'll just finish up the, the last scene of John in for John 1, the scene analysis, and then move on to, to our next uh, part of narrative analysis together. So let's just jump right in to uh, see where are we at. Hopefully getting to character analysis soon, but I did want to, like I said, finish up John. Uh, again, for narrative analysis, we're just looking at, there's four parts to that that we're doing together, the setting and then the scene, which is what we've been stuck at for the last few sessions, and then uh, character and then plot, all right? So, so let's just jump right in on scene analysis of John, John 1. We've so far uh, uh, identified each scene. We did that first. And we identified that there, the location is somewhere in Bethany beyond the Jordan. And in this particular story, it's sometime, probably not long after, Jesus is uh, 40 days in the wilderness. And John, the author, John the Apostle, uh, selected four particular days in right after, or not long after, Jesus' time in the wilderness when he came back. From that, um, John selected four particular days where we see that the first disciples came to meet Jesus. And uh, in these four days, John identifies or notes particular statements that are made um, regarding Jesus. And so we've already looked at the first three scenes in some detail. We've already done the scene analysis for those. Uh, the first scene, uh, which maybe what we'll do is let's just go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and have us read this story again. I know we're familiar with it at this point, but I think it'd be helpful just for us to read John one. And um, I'm gonna ask, yeah, each of us if we could take a few verses. I'll ask uh, Pastor Philip if you could start and just read. Verses 19 to 23, and then uh, Dwayne, if you could take 24 to, to like 29. Kaptuk, um, if you could read uh, 30 to 34. And then Joshua, maybe uh, 35 to 40. And uh, Shulong, 41 to 45. And then Zali, if you could finish from verses 46 to 51. Okay. And hopefully you guys remember your verses because I just forgot who I assigned them to. So, <laughs> um, Pastor Philip, if you could start us off. Sure. Thank you. And John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. And this is the witness of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Therefore, they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, or that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. This one is he who comes after me, of whom I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. On the next day, he saw Jesus coming to him. 
on the next day, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who has been ahead of me, for he existed before me. I did not know him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel. I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he abided on him. And I, do, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water says to me, the one upon whom you see the Spirit descending and abiding on him, this is the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I myself have seen, and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Verse 35. On the next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the name of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and follow Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following, he said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day. It was about the night, it was about the ten. Hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. When Jesus looked at him and he said, You are Simon, the son of John. It shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. On the next day, he decided to go into Galilee, and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we, found him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of J Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can any good things come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said about him, Behold, truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, From where do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Great, thank you. Okay, so we've already looked at in detail the uh, first three scenes of this particular story and done the scene analysis. And if you remember, the scene analysis includes identifying the setting of the scene, the key characters, the important dialogue from those characters, uh, key narrator comments, and then a summary of the scene 
and then observations from the scene. And so we, we focused on the first or finished the first three scenes doing that over the last few sessions. And we noticed that in the first scene, we summarized the idea there in verses 19 to 28 that um, this scene is the testimony of John the Baptist about himself uh, regarding whether he is the Messiah or not. Um, that was the focus of that first scene when the Jews sent by the Pharisees had uh, asked him, who are you? And then the second scene, which was in verses 29 to 34, was on the next day. And again, it, John the Baptist is the focus, and he affirms or testifies that Jesus is the Lamb of God and the Son of God. And so again, it's focused on what was spoken, and in this case, spoken by John the Baptist. So in the first scene, John the Baptist says, I'm not the Messiah. In the second scene, he points to the Messiah, Jesus, who had shown up that day. And then on the third day, uh, another, Andrew, declares Jesus to be the Messiah. And there's some other activity that third day, but that seems to be a key uh, part of that third day is what Andrew, one of the first disciples, says regarding Christ. Andrew, who was a disciple of John the Baptist and is now... Um, noticed Jesus and understands him or believes him to be the Messiah. And then we come to the fourth day. So after uh, he makes that declaration, Andrew does, we come to the, to the next day. Notice the fourth day here. The next day, he, that is Jesus, purposed to go to Galilee. So what I did here, as before, is I've highlighted the different characters uh, in the story, the, the yellow is the narrator comments. The uh, green are the comments from uh, other characters. And then the, the gray are comments from Jesus himself. So what I'd like to do, if I can here, is have us go ahead or have you go ahead and I'll give you a few minutes to go through this particular scene like we did before. And just note each of these six uh, aspects or parts of the scene, the setting, which really we've already identified, right? This is the fourth day. They're still uh, in the, likely around in the Bethany beyond the Jordan, somewhere between Galilee and, and the Dead Sea. All right. But now just focus attention on who are the key characters in this scene, scene four. And... What are some of the important narrator comments? Again, those are in yellow here. So looking at those, what which ones seem important? Important dialogue. Again, that's the green and the gray. The gray being Christ statements. The green being the statements from the other characters. Any key observations that you make? And then finally, a summary for this particular scene, okay? So we'll just follow what you guys did last week. Any questions? Why don't you guys go ahead, take a few minutes, and then we'll come back together. Let's get that up. Okay. All right, the first one's usually pretty straightforward. We already talked about setting, but uh, who are the key characters in this particular scene? Who are the key characters? Jesus, Philip, and Nathaniel. Jesus and Philip. Hey, that's a good name. I like the name Philip and Nathaniel. <laughs> um, yeah, they are the, the key characters that, that comment in this particular scene. Okay, that's the easy part. Now, the narrator comments. What statements by the narrator in this scene uh, stick out or seem important to the story. Maybe uh, let me ask uh, Fu Wei first on that. Anything that you saw, Fu Wei, from the narrator that seemed uh, important? Uh, how about verse 44? Is 
uh, the waste now, Philip was from Bethesda, or the city of Andrew and Peter. <clears throat> yeah, he tells uh, where Philip is from, okay? Hmm. Which is uh, Bethsaida, Bethsaida, which is the same place, I think, as Andrew and Peter, which is an important. So he lives in the same area that Andrew and Peter are from. All right, good. Anything else? So how about verse 45? Philip, uh, the new disciple, also uh, introduces his friend to Jesus. Yes, Philip uh, found Nathaniel. Um, and yeah, introduces, introduces him to Jesus. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so for me, Pastor, uh, Philip's testimony is very simple. And Philip said to him, come and see or something. Yeah. Testimony is very simple. You yourself come and see. Yes. Yeah, we're going to get to the dialogue in a minute. But yeah, most of this scene really is dialogue, right? There's not really much from the narrator, even though it looks like it. Most of it is the narrator just carrying the dialogue, right? Philip said, Nathaniel said, Jesus said. Um, but there is one interesting thing that stuck out to me uh, is uh, it says in verse 43, he found Philip. That is, Jesus found Philip. Uh, mm. But then, notice it says Philip found Nathaniel in verse 45. Oh, and, oh, uh, yes. and then Philip says, we found him. Right? To Nathaniel. Where, really, uh, you know, we, we see the disciples here seem to be the ones seeking. But, but who is it actually that looks for Philip? Um, on on this particular day, you know, I think we're reminded of, uh, you know, ultimately, who is it that seeks the lost? Do the lost seek Jesus, or does Jesus actually find them? And I think just uh, it's an interesting thing here that I was reminded of anyway. That you know, that uh, the Lord. The Lord actually is the one who found Philip here, and then the rest of the events of this scene take place. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's what stuck out to me. <clears throat> Again, there's not much else here uh, from the narrator. Most of this is in the dialogue. So why don't we turn our attention to the dialogue? What, what are some key remarks, key statements made by the characters here uh, in this scene? Uh, Shulong, how about, uh, did you find anything seemed important from the characters' statements from their dialogue? The first thing I've, uh, I found is actually how um, the main character called Jesus and Jesus called himself. The first one is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. That is the, the, the testimony uh, for saying uh, Jesus is a son of man. Then after that, uh, there is another one is from Nathan. Uh, Nathan is a, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And after that, uh, in uh, verse uh, 51, Jesus uh, called himself son of man. Okay, good. So yeah, there's more, more, uh titles or descriptions of Jesus here in this scene, right? Because we've already, in previous scenes, Jesus was referred to as uh, the Messiah, right? The, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. And now here, notice uh, several more uh, 
things are said about him. So I think that's very important. Uh, what was the other one you mentioned? Oh, son of man in verse 51. And then also even verse 45, right? Found him of whom Moses wrote. Yep. Him of whom Moses and the prophets wrote. Good. Yeah, I think that's a key observation. Anything else? And the second one is uh, this, uh, about the supernatural experiences. So supernatural uh, experiences is when Jesus said, follow me. And that's then uh, it is a miracle that's filled very fast for him. That means this is the, uh, what's it, that's, uh, the believing after the weaknesses. And then after that, uh, how Nathaniel believe? Because he's uh, already mentioned, you believe it? Do you believe it? Because um, before Philip called you when you were under the fig, uh, fig tree, I saw you. This is the, was it the second miracle? The supernatural experiences, experience uh, happened to Nathaniel. First to Philip, then Nathaniel. Then after that, he mentioned about the greater uh, supernatural experience will uh, come after this uh, happened to uh, maybe both of uh, the rest of the, uh, the, 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 the disciples. This is, uh, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, good. So Nathaniel experienced that. And then uh, what uh, Jesus says, verse 51. Okay. Good. I put that under observations, uh, though it did come from the dialogues, but I just put it as an observation. All right, any, anybody else have anything they see from the dialogue that's significant? Joshua, you have anything? Yeah, I think verse 51 is like, you know, the narrator wanted to end this scene with his last words. So that that seems to uh, like highlight the importance of verse fifty one. <laughs> I mean, this is my observation. Yeah, it's very interesting. There's no ladder there. They they descend and ascend on the Son of Man. So the Lord Jesus is the one that is going to be the communication or the means or the vehicle of. Uh, the uh, mm -hmm. you know, the descending of the angels or the messengers or the yeah the, the yeah. no ladder yep and yeah back in, uh, back in back in Genesis you are referring to back in Genesis when Jacob saw in the dream right he saw the ladder the angel of God ascending and descending on it but here yeah you're right uh, christ is is the yeah maybe i just use the word mediator <laughs> between god and man yeah i uh, did see it myself i read it in the macarthur study bible and that's really interesting what what <laughs> chapter was the jacobs i forgot third 30 something, right? I think it's uh, Genesis 28. Oh, 20, is it 28? Yeah, Jacob's dream, chapter 28, verse 11. Ah, okay. Verse yeah. 12, verse 12, actually. Okay. Put that there. Okay, good.
Yeah. I, it's, excuse me. I yeah, also go ahead. found that uh, uh, most of the dialogue of ne uh, Nathaniel's is, are actually the question, can any good thing come out of Nazareth and how do you know me? Since seemingly he is testing the Jesus. So yeah, his statements uh, are, are questions, aren't they? Verse 46 and uh, yeah, verse 48. And then, right? And then he makes the this the statement, right? The key statement here, doesn't he? Verse 49. Yep. In the dialogue, also the, the, the last word of 51, Turi, Turi, I say to you, Turi, Turi, how the, uh, Jesus indicates uh, the importance of the truth, the importance of the truth. Yes, very good. Yeah, every time it says truly, truly, it's really important. And so uh, he's pointing to himself there as a son of man as significant. Yes. All right, good. How might we summarize this scene? Anybody want to offer a testimony of who Christ is? Yeah, the, uh, the, the disciples he's collecting, and of course, are all very serious and spiritual men. Uh, these are men of, uh, you know, of real quality. They, they, their, their answers and their statements and their actions all point that Jesus knows what he's doing. These aren't just ordinary, uh, what I say, Galileans. These are people. And then later on, he gets Matthew, who is obviously a scholar in Old Testament law. Now, even a good candidate for writing the book of Hebrews, although I don't think he did that, but uh, yeah, the information that Matthew had is really amazing. Now, these guys were uh, uh, prepared, you know, of the Lord. Really amazing. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, you know, they, they had a, an interest in the Messiah and also a, uh, you know, some understanding of that. So, so that this, this was the key focus of what they were talking about here in this particular scene. But yeah, I think that's a good, a good summary, Joshua. Testimony yeah. of who Christ is. Yeah, and they're really talking about Jesus. They're all very interested and focused in on this one. Yes. Uh, that uh, here they're, they're following. Yep. It's all centered around him and who he is, right? Hmm. In this particular scene. All right, good. Does anybody have it? Would they, uh, anyone add any, have any changes or? To that summary or everyone think that looks okay yeah i think i think so we again you can always add more in the summary but this, it's really just meant to identify what seems to be the key uh the key event or in this case uh, statement of the um uh, of the scene and so i think now it's it's good to step back and and really consider, all right, um, each of these scenes, you know, if we were to take, these are our scene summaries from before, and then I, I just, I modified it. I just said Philip and Nathaniel declared Jesus, but we could say that, or the, the first disciples. Um, 
But here, so in the first scene, again, it's testimony, right? It's, it's dialogue. In fact, right, each of these scenes, the focus is it's dialogue is being given. And that's what John the author includes. He just includes the statements that are made uh, by each of these guys. And so uh, in the first scene, it's John the Baptist, his testimony that he's not the Christ, right? I, I kind of simplified it down here. All right. Uh, John says who he is not, that he's not the Christ. Then the focus in day two is John the Baptist then identifies or testifies who is the Christ. And there he calls him the Lamb and the Son of God. And then the third day, Andrew, so this is someone else, identifies the Messiah. And then the fourth day, we have the Philip and Nathaniel identify him. And again, they gave him other descriptions as well. The uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the uh, King of Israel, the Son of God. Um, but essentially, all of these days, you know, this is what I find interesting in this particular story, that here you have four days, right? And lots of things can happen in a day, right? I mean, uh, especially when it comes to Jesus. <laughs> uh, a lot of, of important things could happen in a particular day. And yet, John, the author, only tells us a few statements from each of these four days that this story is just made up of um, uh, what is said about Jesus on those four days and just a few lines. I mean, we read the story. It just took us, you know, less than five minutes or so to read the whole story. And that covers four days of time. And so, again, we have to think, Okay, what is John, the author, doing here? Um, he, he starts his gospel with uh, the theological declaration about Christ, that he is both God, divine and human, right? He is uh, with God and was God, and then the word became flesh. Um, he was the light of the world. He was creator. He describes all these things about Christ. And then the very first story in his book is doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus or the conception of Jesus or the birth of Jesus. It doesn't begin with even um, describing John the Baptist's ministry like Mark does. It doesn't begin with um, even the baptism. It begins with these four days that John the author felt were important for, uh, as he was telling his story, uh, regarding Christ. And those four days just the, basically are only a few lines of dialogue from each day. And again, you know, when, when Jesus shows up and John says, behold, the Lamb of God, it takes away the sins of the world. You, you know, I'm thinking, well, what did Jesus say that day? Did they interact with each other? Did, did Jesus say anything else? What else did John say? Well, we don't know. John did not give attention to any of that. His focus was on particular statements made each of those first those four days. Particular statements made about Jesus. So we need to think about this again when we when we're considering the, the author's intent, right? I mean, if if you think about uh, you know, if, let's say that we we uh spent four days together, right? Let's say we we had a retreat and we, you know. We we uh, all came together in this retreat, and we spent four days together. Um, right, we may sing together, pray together, have meals, uh, you know, laugh, uh, uh, listen to Dwayne's uh, many stories that would really in, in interest us and engage us. Right, um, we would we would maybe uh, you know eat, share some theological conversation. But right, we would say a lot of things together in four days, wouldn't we? But yet here, John only puts a few statements that were made each of those four particular days that he's talking about. So keep that in mind as you think about, okay, what is the overall point of this story? And how does it fit to uh, John's, the apostle, and what he's trying to accomplish in 
in writing his book and, and the point he's trying to make in, in his gospel. Um, I think this is a really good example of how an author, especially an author of the narrative, how he selects particular statements or events that he chooses to tell us about in the writing of his story. And we see here clearly this gospel isn't meant to just give us a history of things that Jesus said and did. Otherwise, we'd have a lot more detail, I think, about things that were said or that happened the, during these four days. But, but John only gives us uh, just a few remarks uh, from them. And again, if I were right, if we were to take a look at uh, each of these scenes, right, we would see there's not a lot of dialogue, honestly. There's a little bit in each day. There's there's more dialogue here in this last scene. But uh, again, this is all this last scene we did. That's all that he records from the fourth day. Just a few statements, a few questions from Nathaniel. Uh, a couple of statements by Philip, and some some what one two three four state five statements by Jesus, and that's it from that day. So I think uh, uh, I don't remember who mentioned this, but that last verse, right, where Jesus' statement about this, this angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. So again. John felt that was a very important thing Jesus said that connects to this particular story. And, by the way, is how it ends, right? The next verse is Jesus is now in Galilee, right? Verse 43 says Jesus wanted to go there. And then this fourth day happens. And then chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus is in Galilee. So, so verse 51 is the end of the story this first story in John. So, uh, again, I think putting importance and emphasis on that last statement by Christ as well, uh, that I am the Son of Man. Basically, it's his declaration, or, or the Christ, right? So, um, again, I think this story is a helpful, uh, gives us helpful insight into how biblical narratives work. And what the authors are trying to do here. So John's pointing out he's taking event or really statements, uh, testimony from those four days, sometime after Jesus comes back from the wilderness, when the first disciples met him. And again, the focus of the story is not, you know, I, I've seen some outlines from John and they'll make the focus of the story is Jesus meets his first disciples. Well, yes. This is where the first disciples uh, uh, find Jesus, but that's not the point of the story, right? That happens in the story. We see that in the story, but the point of the story is, is all about who Jesus is, not that he met his first disciples. Um, so how do I know that? Well, because every scene, <laughs> the focus is on particular statements made about who Jesus is. And in the last scene, uh, the last two scenes, they are statements from the first disciples. But um, that's not the, the emphasis here or the focus at all. Any thoughts or comments about that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we've got a really good... Uh, idea of who Jesus is here now after all this narrative and uh, dialogue, everything. It just, it just it constantly is is pointing to the Lord and um, adding to you know, the wonder of his person. The, uh, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the the uh, ladder that's going to uh, acquaint us and give us the message from heaven. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like John the author, right, at the beginning of his book, he makes a statement about who Jesus is. And then the very first story says, okay, um, this isn't just what I am saying. This is actually what was being said about him at the beginning of his ministry. 
Uh, because basically, right after this, uh, Jesus, um, right, Jesus had been baptized. He'd been in the wilderness. Now he's come back from the wilderness. And so it's basically right here that his ministry begins, uh, his public ministry. He goes up to Galilee and um, he, uh, the first miracle takes place, right? Turning the water to wine, John chapter 2. So we'll come back to this story again later uh, and look at a few more uh, things. But I really wanted to spend a lot of time on the scene analysis so that you could see uh, um, the importance of it. And even though there's a lot of work and maybe some, you know, a lot of details, uh, it's, it's worth the effort to really dig in and try to understand what is going on in each, in each of these scenes and then putting them all together. Because remember, the scenes are like a paragraph in an epistle, right? Each scene presents events or dialogue, um, things that have happened. And each scene describes those particular things. And then all together, the scenes connect to form the story, which has a point overall. And so when we get to the plot, we'll come back to this uh, story and, and look at how that, that happens. OK, but what I'd like to do is in the, in the time remaining, turn our attention to the next, uh, the next, the third element or uh, aspect of narrative analysis, which is the characters. Now, this isn't, this is looking at the primary characters of the story overall. OK, not just the ones in each scene, but actually looking at the story as a whole. Who are the primary characters? And when you think of characters, uh, what, what are characters? How would you describe the characters of, of a story? Anybody can give us a, like a simple definition or description? Who are characters? The movers of the story. Uh, sorry, the what of the story? The mover, move, oh, mover. Oh, okay, yeah, the movers of the story. Uh, good, that's a good way to describe them. What do you mean by that, the movers of the story? Uh, instead of the, 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 the narrators who give the, the, give the uh, storyline, but uh, the, the act, they are actually the, um, the person who are in the story to move that uh, storyline. Okay, so the, the people in the story who, who uh, how would we put that? Who say and do things that plot or the, the point of the story. Could you say, could I say it that way? Yeah, to act. Yeah, who act. Okay. All right, good. Anybody else have a... That really answers both questions. Yeah, they're, they're contributors. I mean, the ones that contribute the, the um, information. Or All right, good. And as we think about um, these characters, I think that's a good, good description. In fact, even as I was thinking about it, uh, I liked how you use that word move long because they, they they help move the action of the story forward and lead us to the meaning of the author so yeah I like that term movers um they they uh through what they say and what they do um they give us clues to understand the meaning of of the story and when we consider the characters there's really just a few main types of characters Anybody know what are the main types of characters that appear in narratives? They they have a, a 
a description or a, a title. Anybody know that? How are the main characters described? Well, I know you mentioned the antagonists, and really, I don't think there's an antagonist here. I mean, it's just moving forward in um, a very positive way. But that's one. Yeah, protagonist. I don't remember any others. Yeah, protagonist, good. And we'll talk about what these are in a minute. There's, there's the protagonist, the antagonist, and really, uh, any, any other main characters that come to mind in a story, generally speaking? We might say the narrator. He's not technically not a character uh, doing stuff in the story, but but he is contributing <laughs> to carrying the story along. And then there's another group, potential group, uh, called a foil. All right, we'll talk about them as well. Okay, so as we think about each of these, uh, the protagonist, right? He he or she's the main character. Uh, they had, they rise up as being the key focus of the story. So in John one, who's who's the protagonist? Who's the main character? John. All right, John's the author, the narrator. The main character in the story of John one would be Jesus, of course, right? The protagonist. The story's primarily focused on the protagonist or the main character. Um, all right, and then there are many examples I put here. They'll be in your notes you can look at, but uh, examples of the main character in particular stories. And, and what's interesting, like in the book of Genesis, we see the main characters moving, changing over the course of, of the book. Um, honestly, we could say really the main character is God in those stories. Um, but as we look at the individual stories within the book, we can see the, the primary characters, the main character, the, the protagonist uh, changes from Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, uh, Moses in Exodus. So this is the main character of the story. Now, uh, and the character, by the way, doesn't always appear at the beginning of the story. Think of David in 1 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, uh, the book of Samuel, David really is the main character, the protagonist. But he doesn't show up until, I think, what, chapter 16? Um, and then he doesn't say or do anything until chapter 17 of, of the, the book. So that's like, what, a, a 25 per, a quarter of the way in uh, before he appears in the book. So, But he is clearly the main character in Samuel. All right, so that's the, the protagonist. So if that's the protagonist, what do you think uh, the antagonist might be? Anybody? In the song. The main character who creates the trouble. Okay, good. The main character who creates the trouble or, or the problem in the story, right? At the tension, actually. The tension, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. And really causes it for whom? Right? He generally he he opposes the protagonist, right? Pro means for and ant ant means against. So uh the main character, the protagonist, is usually he's opposed by the antagonist. All right. And sometimes an antagonist can be a group. Uh, we're going to see that in, in the Gospel of John, right? Uh, several times where where Jesus is, he's, he's always the main character, but then there are times where the Pharisees as a group come against him. So the antagonist isn't doesn't have to just be one character, but can be a group of characters. Or sometimes we see this in John 4. Uh, with the woman at the well, the antagonist in that story is really the, the cultural prejudice 
because uh, Jesus is speaking to this woman, the Samaritan woman, and uh, really the antagonist, if you will, the thing that opposes Jesus is, is the cultural prejudice, especially by the Jews, that he should not be talking with a Samaritan, especially a Samaritan woman. And that's the problem in the story, uh, in that particular story. So often an antagonist is, is a single person, like uh, in David and Goliath, the antagonist is, right, Goliath, right, the one person. But in other times, the antagonist could be, uh, like I said, a group of people. Uh, so uh, keeping that in mind. But So the main idea is think of the protagonist as the main character, the focal character of the story that, that, that the story centers around. The antagonist opposes that main character or creates a problem or a tension for that main character. Okay? Questions so far? Does that make sense? All right. Uh, so those are the two. Almost, you know, most every story you're going to see that. You'll see the the hero or the main character, the focus of the story, and then you'll see another character or characters that create a problem in the story. Now, sometimes an antagonist might be a natural disaster or an event, right? That it's whatever creates the problem for the main character. Okay. Usually a person, but not always. Okay, I mean, if you're watching a movie about somebody who is is lost in the in the wilderness, or he's out at sea, right, by himself on a on a little boat, and he's trying to survive, uh, there's no other person that's causing problems, but it could be just the the ocean, right, is the antagonist uh, that's creating the problem, or or if he's out in the cold, you know, nature uh, being the problem or creating the issues for the main character. So it's not always a person, but usually is a person uh, or persons. All right. So that's the, the antagonist. So we have the protagonist, we have the antagonist. And then, as I mentioned, there's this other character or could be characters called the foil. Now, what is a foil? Well, these are other characters in the story that are seem to be important characters. Like, for example, in John 1, we have Nathaniel and Philip who and John the Baptist, who they make statements in the story. Um, uh, and so they, they seem to have an important role in the story, but uh, the main character is, is Jesus in that story. So uh, these are other characters that seem important. And what foils do in a story is they, um, they often say or do things that, you can, that contrast or compare with the protagonist or antagonist. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, first, think about the term foil actually... Uh, comes from a jewelry term where uh, gems would often be placed upon a, a, a reflective material in order to um, emphasize or exaggerate the, the brilliance of the, of the stone. So a foil is used to, to uh, draw out or make more clear the brilliance of a particular gem that's being examined. And so that's what foils are meant to do in a story. They're meant to, to be a comparison or a contrast to the main characters, to the protagonist or the antagonist, to, to either be a comparison to what they're doing or, or a contrast to what they're doing. For example, in John 4, the story of the woman at the well, you have a uh, Jesus as a main character, and one of the foils in that story, uh, I think, are the the disciples, um, who and who should be, they should be concerned about sharing the about the Messiah to the lost, but but they aren't. In contrast to Jesus, who is sharing the gospel with the Samaritan woman, 
and then the rest of the Samaritans. And so the disciples there uh, fail to do what Jesus, uh, the main character, was doing. And you can see this in many stories. There's these other characters that aren't the main character, but they seem important. And so you need to examine, look at them and see, uh, is there something that they say or do that the author is using to compare or contrast with, with the, the main characters? All right. Now, in a lot of stories, there's also other characters that, that aren't. They're just part of the story, part of the background of the story. Um, and, uh, they aren't really there for anything, but just, just telling the story. So we have to be able to identify, um, foils would be those characters that are, that are not just part of the background of the story, but, but who the author uses to, um, to draw out understanding the, the point of the story better by seeing how they contrast with or compare to the antagonist or, or the protagonist, okay? For example, um, you think about the story of David and Goliath, right? And how does that story begin, right? David is sent by his father to bring supplies to his brothers, right? His brothers are in the army. You guys remember this? And and uh, David's father, Jesse, uh, sends David, the youngest, to bring supplies to his brothers. And then, and then who is it that David meets? In fact, let's just look at this. Uh, 1 Samuel. David clearly is the main character in this story, right? As we'll see when he confronts Goliath. But in this story, right, we're introduced to, to Goliath here. The Philistines and the Israelites are gathered for battle. Goliath comes out, right, and he taunts the Philistines, uh, challenges them to battle. Um, then the, the older sons of Jesse had gone uh, to fight, and David... Um, was sent, verse 17, take for your brothers. So he's sent with some food, some supplies to take them to his brothers. Uh, and so David does that. It says he gets up in the morning and he takes the supplies and he goes to the camp where they were there. And then, and then David, as he's there, he hears about Goliath, right? And so David, these are the first words out of David's mouth in the Samuel, right? What will be done for the man who strikes this Philistine down, right? He said, I, clearly he's like, I want to, I'm going to do this. Well, notice verse 28. Then Eliab, his older brother, when he spoke to the men, when David spoke, his anger burned against David. Why have you come down? And with whom have you left the sheep? I know your arrogance and the wickedness of your heart. You've come down to see the battle, right? You can see that, like this argument between these brothers, right? Then David says, what, well, wait, what have I done? I, I was just talking. <laughs> but so you have to ask, okay, Eliab here, is he just a ran? Why does um, author of Samuel include this statement by the brother? And I, I think, this is just my opinion, but I think it is, He's serving as a foil here because the Israelites should have been standing up to this giant to declare uh, right against what he was saying and doing. But it's here, David, this young man, who's a shepherd. He's the one who has the boldness and courage to, to confront this giant when Eliab, his older brother, and later we'll see Saul himself even choose not to stand for Israel or for the Lord when David does. So I think in this particular story, David is the, the, the main character. He's the protagonist. The antagonist would be Goliath, right? He's the one that causes the problem in the story. And I think the foils in this story would be uh, Saul and Eliab as a contrast to David, that, that 
these other men, David's older brother, and the king for sure should have been those who would stand up against this guy, but they don't. But David does. And so I think in this story, those would be an example of a, of a foil, a, a, a key character, but not the main character. But they're included in the story in order to draw attention to the main characters, either good or bad, as a contrast or a comparison. Okay? So as you're examining stories, um, make sure you can, one, identify the, the main character, the protagonist, and two, also the antagonist who's opposing the main character. And then look at the other characters and see if any of them uh, seem to have this role as a foil, that the author included them specifically to be a comparison or contrast. All right. And like I said, many stories uh, will have other characters uh, that aren't main characters. They're just part of the background of the story. All right. I think like um, like in Genesis 22, the, the two young men who go with them, uh, who go with Abraham and Isaac. I don't think those are main characters. They don't really don't say or do anything that's important in the story, but they're just part of what took place. Um, so part of the setting or the background, if you will. Okay, questions on that? Does that make sense? Foils, these are the characters. All right, these? Uh, we just call them fillers. They fill up fillers. The, the gaps. Yeah. <laughs> That's really, really neat. Uh, that uh, brings it. Yeah, so you, you you could probably the the last the other characters who don't who don't have a key role. Yeah, I think fillers. Maybe I should add that category um, there. But uh, most stories are going to have. You know these characters, the antagonist, the protagonist, the antagonist. Most stories will have fo a foil or foils, uh, and then usually, yeah, filler characters, extras that are just part of the background, and then the narrator. Those are commonly found uh, the main key characters in in stories. Any thoughts or comments about that? Uh, in Chinese, in Chinese, we call these foils uh, green leaves. Under the flower to make the flower more beauty, more beautiful. Ah. So we call that this, this is actually that they are equivalent to the supporting actor. So uh, actually the support they won't change the main storyline, but they will support the main character to and to enrich or to extend the the storyline uh, indeed. Uh, they're called green leaves. Is that what you said? Yes. Interesting. Green leaf under the flower. I like that better than the foil. I don't know where the word, why foil became the, because <laughs> in our country, a foil is like a metal that you use to wrap food. <laughs> so, but um, that's what, that's the accepted English term, but I, I like uh, green leaves better. So how do you say that in Chinese? That's better. I can't pronounce it right, but I like that better. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good, that exactly captures the idea. So you have the flower there and what's supporting or, or bringing out the beauty or details of that flower, the leaves around it. That, that's a good, good picture. Good, any other comments or thoughts, questions about these characters? All right, good. I've already mentioned uh, another one. We've already talked about this key character quite a bit in our scene analysis, and that is the, the narrator. Um, again, 
maybe we should put narrator in, in quotes as a as a character. Um, since he he's not in the story as far as you know doing saying and doing things, but he is you know another um, voice in the story that really guides and directs the story, right? Uh, and of course, the narrator is, is the author. You understand that, but uh, he really develops the story. He he provides the the background information in the story. He um, moves the the dialogue, identifies who's speaking, and, and then he's the one who may give us additional um, insight into the thoughts of the character. He may describe certain actions, but but he he's the one really that that. Uh, that draws attention, I think, to the key elements of the story. And, and the narrator is, I think, you know, even more important in many ways to the characters of the story because he's the one that directs us on what to see and what to understand from the story. And so, um, right, if, if we just think about it this way, if we just had in the story, if we just had the character dialogue, right? We could learn some things about the point of the story, but if there was no comment from the narrator, um, we would not necessarily identify the main idea of the story. Okay, so he's the one that's giving us clues or direct statements often, things that we should know as the reader if we are to understand the point of the story. Okay, so the narrator is in my view, uh, he's the one that helps guides and direct us. He's the voice in the background that says, okay, you need to know this, right? Okay, don't, don't, don't overlook this. Or so he, he's pointing out to us important insights uh, along with the actual dialogue and the actions of the characters. Um, so really, if you, if you took out every story, I mean, try this one time, just, Take a story from scripture and remove all the narrator comments and then see how that affects uh, the story. So uh, the narrator statements are very important to, to see, understand the point of the story. Um, and then finally, when it comes to key characters in biblical narratives, um, I already mentioned this before, but really, you know, the central character of scripture is, is God himself. Um, I think this may uh, seem like an obvious point, but it is one that's often overlooked, especially in sermons that I hear, particularly from Old Testament uh, narratives, uh, where the focus is all on the human character. And what the human character said and what, how we need to follow the example of the human character or not follow the example of this character. And certainly there are lessons to be learned from the human characters. But we have to remember the central person in the story is, is God himself. And what is God doing? What is God showing about himself? What is God wanting us to learn and understand about himself in each of those particular stories? Not just what did the human characters do or say in the story. So we can't neglect what it is that we are to learn about God from, from the particular story, stories. Now, in the Gospels, it's easy. Jesus, you know, is the direct main character. The things he says and does, the story center around him. But a lot of the, like, story David and Goliath or a lot of the Old Testament narratives um, may not mention God directly or explicitly throughout the narrative. And so we can tend to forget he's, he's really the main character in that narrative. Uh, for example, uh, you know, in the book of Jonah, we might think about Jonah as the main character, but really Jonah is the antagonist. If you think about it, right? God wants to show mercy on the lost. Jonah opposes him. It's like, I'm not going to Nineveh. No way. I'm not going to. I know what you're going to do, God. You're going to show mercy. So I don't want to go. 
And then when God does show mercy, what does Jonah do? See, I told you, God, I knew that's what you were going to do. Now I want to die, you know. So he's like, he's the, he's the one creating the problem in the story. He's not the hero of the story. He's the antagonist, right? God's the main character. God wants to show mercy, show compassion. Um, and despite Jonah, he does, <laughs> right? He shows compassion on the sailors by not only delivering them from the storm, but uh, I think the sailors come to believe, fear Yahweh. He shows mercy on the Ninevites, of course. When they repent, he does not bring judgment. And then he shows mercy on Jonah as well by delivering him out of the, the ocean and also uh, confronting him on the end about his, his self-righteous heart. But so you look at a story like, like Jonah, and, you know, Jonah's not the main the protagonist in that story. He's not the main character. He's not the hero. He's actually the antagonist. God is the, the protagonist in that particular story. So this is important to, to, to understand as you interpret biblical narrative that do not forget or do not leave out um, God as the, as the central character. Now, sometimes in a particular story, like David and Goliath, the, the main character, the protagonist of the story uh, would be David, the human character. But, but understand, how is God working um, in and through David in that particular story? That that, that needs to be, be our focus as well. Let me have, ask, um, where are we at here? Uh, Fu Wei, I'm going to, or John Sheng, I'm going to ask you to do this. Can you read for me? Uh, I have a quote here from uh, Walt Kaiser. I think it's very helpful. Uh, John Sheng, can you read? Ah. Sure. Sorry, let me get the quote up for you here. All right. He's okay. <laughs> there we go. Can you read that for okay. me? Sure. The central character of the Bible is God. This comes as no surprise. For in almost every narrative, God is present explicitly or by implication. Therefore, the interpreter's and expositor's attention must be centered on God's role in the narrative. This reminds us that all efforts to concentrate on the human character is in a story while failing to locate God's action in the narrative are wrong. It leads to divorcing the character from God's larger redemptive plan by passing the point that the author was making. Accordingly, one of our key questions in determining the characterization of a narrative is, what is God doing in this scene? Great, thank you. I think this is a helpful statement by Walt, Walt Kaiser in reminding us that, you know, as we study the story, certainly we need to understand what the human character is doing in the story and who is the main character and who is the, the protagonist, the antagonist and all that. But, but we must not uh, fail to see what is God doing through those characters in the story. And so I liked his question there. What is God doing in this in this scene? Um, great example of this would be the book of Esther. Uh, if I remember correctly, is God's name mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther? I don't think it is, right? Not explicitly. But yet, don't we not see the hand of God moving through that whole story? Right? How God orchestrates the events of that story and bringing Esther and Ham uh, uh, Mordecai even to the right place at the right time, and then bringing Esther to the right place at the right time, and just so we clearly see God at work through that story, yet He's never mentioned directly in the story. So if you're to preach through Esther, and you don't mention how you know, God's role in that particular story, uh, as Walt Kaiser says, you, you've missed the point. <laughs> There's some way in which God's at work in that story to accomplish his purposes, 
that we need to see. And then, as he says, connect that to the bigger narrative of scripture, his redemptive plan. And how does that tie into what God is doing in all the Bible um, as well? So I think, I think we need to make sure whenever we preach uh, any passage, obviously, but even especially narratives and Old Testament narratives, we do not neglect to uh, direct attention to, to God and what he's doing and what we learn about him from that particular story. Okay? Any final thoughts or comments, questions from you guys before we uh, end our time tonight? Um, next time we gather next week, Lord willing, we'll uh, go through uh, Genesis. I want to take us back to Genesis 22, and we're going to look at the characters in that story and do what, what I call a character analysis, right? So uh, we'll talk about what that is and then go through an example together uh, from Genesis 22. Okay. Well, I know it's late there, some of you guys, so I want to go ahead and end our time here. Um, let me ask uh, Pastor Philip if you could close our time in prayer.